Okay, uh, I think it's two oh one, so we can get started. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, joining us on this Alpha Fold uh, Town Hall. Uh, so the meeting is basically going to be run in two parts. The first part is all going to be about what Alpha Fold and what Collab Fold are, how they work, and how you can run them on O2. And um, and the second part of the meeting will be about research projects related to uh, Alpha Fold and and Collab Fold and how you can use them to actually. Um, further, further some research projects. Uh, so, I, is there any way to mute the people coming in? Um, is anyone else hearing that? The little ding, 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 um, or is that just me? If you click on participants uh, in the bottom right corner, there's an there's an option to say "Don't ding." I'm unmute. Okay, great. Thanks, Sergey. And actually, uh, thank you for chiming in because you are our first speaker. All right. So yeah, once again, thank you everyone for joining us uh, in this uh, in this hopefully very informative presentation on AlphaFold as it relates to O2. Uh, our first speaker um, is uh, Sergey. Um, I'm going to try to pronounce your last name, but I'm going to pronounce it wrong, and I'm sorry for that. Sergey Ovchinkov. Um, Dr. Sergey received his BS in micro and molecular biology from Portland State University and a PhD in molecular and cellular biology from the University of Washington in Seattle. In the lab of Dr. David Baker, Sergey worked on algorithms for protein structure determination using evolutionary information. Currently, Sergey is a John Harvard Distinguished Science Fellow at Harvard, where, he is, uh, where his group is interested in developing a unified statistical model of protein evolution to better understand phylogenetics, protein folding, origins of life, and multicellularity, and to mine metagenomic dark matter sequences to discover new protein families, functions, and protein-protein interactions. Uh, Sergey will be presenting uh, introduction to AlphaFold and ColapFold and what they're for, examples of input and output. Thank you so much, Sergey, for joining us. Uh, feel free to take it away. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Oh, uh, thank you very much for the invite. I'm happy to be here today. Um, so actually here, let me share my screen here. So I, I posted the slides that I'll be showing in, in the uh, just in the chat box. So if anybody wants to see them or decide whether or not they want to stay for this whole thing. Um, but uh, the topic that I'll be talking about is Collab Fold uh, and how we're trying to make it accessible to everyone. Uh, and the intended and sort of unintended uses of, of Collab Fold. Um, I put together a few introductory slides about the protein folding problem because I thought maybe there are some people that kind of want to know like what exactly is AlphaFold doing and how does it relate to like previous algorithms that, that did structure prediction. Um, but if it starts to look a little too simple, feel free to tell me to skip and I, I could skip a few slides. But I'll, I'll just assume that people haven't really thought, uh, know too much about like previous work on protein structure prediction, just start from the beginning. Uh, so introducing the protein folding problem using evolution information, uh, then I'll move on to describing like how do you interpret the outputs of the model. And then if we have time, maybe I can come back to this during discussion, uh, some intended uses of, of these algorithms for lots of interesting applications like protein design, uh, screening for binders and all that kind of stuff, which I think really cool other things that you could do with AlphaFold besides just predicting structures. Um, so I guess, as we all know, uh, proteins fold up inside the cell. They go from a single sequence to a full structure. Um, and these start from DNA to RNA to amino acid sequence. And, and one of the big things we always wanted to do is, um, actually, the, the ding is a little bit distract. Is there, is there where to, I, I, I think. Yeah, I, sorry, can you, can you repeat how to, how to mute that, Sergey? So if you Apologies click on participants, um, and there should be a little um, option right below them that says, don't play sound upon entry or exit. Okay, I see invite uh, and mute me, but I also might not be the host. Uh, Sunil, can you see, check to see if that's the, uh, um, if you can see that option? Yeah, uh, just a second here. Um, okay, well, it looks like the ding stopped, so I'll, I'll just continue. But if you guys <laughs> could, all right, so so the big, big picture here. Um, is, so the, the idea is like, can we do this inside the computer? Um, and, and so the way people like to think about the protein folding problem is you have, sort of energy landscape. These are all the possible conformations and the proteins sort of exist at some uh, global optima. And, and the, to go from sequence to structure, what you have to do is search through the space and try to find this global optima. So this is a picture from Kendall's group. Um, and, 
And so here the idea is like, if you move around, maybe you'll find it. And, and so they just like, can we make computers do the same thing? Uh, so there's been a lot of work done just in trying to develop these energy functions. Uh, and then, and also developing like really, really fast search algorithms or take some kind of shortcuts to do this. Um, and so people have been trying to parameterize different energy functions, like trying to think of rumor, salvation, ionic interactions with the idea then if you have a good energy and then you have enough compute, you can search and find the solution. Um, but, and, and so this is a, a animation here of a, one particular algorithm, Rosetta, which takes fragments, recombines them and uses this kind of energy, tries to find the best solution. Uh, and it turns out these work reasonably well for small proteins with, with short loops. Um, and you could sort of use this to find the correct solution, but they quickly start to break down as soon as you have really long loops or non-ideal uh, secondary structure. Um, especially if you start looking at real proteins that are gigantic complexes, um, even if you have the perfect energy function, like finding that solution would not be something we could do with our modern computers. Um, and so the question is, can we somehow cheat? Can we somehow get around this problem? Um, and, and so one way to do that is to say, well, instead of using a single sequence and try to predict it, what you could do is you can get uh, collect a, a whole bunch of sequences that are related and look for these patterns of covariation. Um, and, and I think you, given you guys are at Harvard, you probably know some work by uh, Deborah Marx. I think she's been trying to do this, use this kind of information as well for structural prediction, mutant effect prediction and so on. But the, the idea is very similar here. And I have a citation here if you're curious. It's a lot of people that kind of worked in this field. It's hard to list them all out, but you can take a look here and, and see it. Um, but the idea is like you can look at these uh, mutations and pairs of mutations and try to use that to tell you something about the structure. Um, and because these things are very important in the structure, you imagine they'll be conserved in the, in, in the multiple sequence alignment and, and you'll see that information. Um, and, and so th this has been really, really important and sort of made a huge breakthrough in terms of structure predictions, because imagine if you if I go back a few slides, if I told you at the very beginning that the N and T C terminus are right next to each other, you could probably simplify the search problem significantly by just bringing those things together. You don't have to do a lot of search after that. Um, and so, so sort of deriving these constraints between pair of residues has become quite important in that regard. Um, uh, just a quick introduction on how to read a contact map. So this is a protein structure. I'm showing it N to C terminus, so blue to red. Um, and so if you want to show this as, as a contact map, you could go N to C, N to C. And if I want to show the context between the cyan and this orange part, I can show them as such. Um, this will become more important later because AlphaFold does return also a contact map. And so I thought maybe a good way to think about how do you actually interpret these contact maps is you could actually see uh, these, these, uh, uh, this, this is what the map represents. Like there's certain distances that are close together. Um, and, and here, interestingly, these are the contacts that are predicted from these convolution methods. You can see they overlay really nicely. And so if you didn't know what the structure was, and I told you just these uh, blue dots, you could, and these blue dots are represented here as these white lines. You can imagine like putting a bunch of rubber bands between residues, maybe snapping the structure into place. Um, so, uh, but, but one thing that turns out that Covolution contacts have a little bit of interesting signal. So instead of just being residues that are um, covariating and you might think just forms into a monomeric structure, turns out some of these residues may be because they form like homodimers or because some of these residues are, interact with uh, ligand mediation or maybe involved in conformational changes. Uh, and so it turns out because of this noise, which, I, which is actually not really noise, it's really biological, it becomes really hard to actually predict the monomer. Um, and, and so people in the field have been working on this problem for over the last two decades or so now, uh, trying to figure out, okay, how do you take these convolution contacts, do folding and sort of get a clean contact map, sort of remove. So besides just noise coming from lack of data, but also like this biological thing that, that sometimes implements or prevents you from, from working really well. Um, and, and some of the breakthroughs have been to, to use neural networks instead. So instead of trying to take these contacts, do a bunch of folding and hoping to find a structure that makes as many contacts as possible, you could feed it to a neural network and try to clean this information up. Um, and so this is alpha fold one, uh, effectively what it was trying to do. And, and, and you could argue maybe alpha fold two is doing to some extent as well. Um, okay, so, so, so the big picture here is, so often what you do is, you, so the traditional methods, the way they worked, and this is, I'm a little biased because I'm from the Baker lab, this is the way we did it, is you, you take a sequence, you search against a database of related sequences, you construct a multiple sequence alignment, um, you, from that, you can construct a PSSM. This is the conservation of every position. From that, you could predict the secondary structure. This is like helix, sheet, or loop. Uh, based on that, you could pick fragments. So fragments for, for every uh, set of nine residues, you can try to 
pre uh, predict what the secondary structure is and then, and then steal fragments from the PDB uh, that, that satisfy those conditions. And then you could just recombine these guys to pre predict your structure. And that was that animation that I showed to you guys a few slides ago. Um, and the reason why this becomes quite relevant and it turns out it's also potentially relevant for alpha fold is that it turns out that you can have the exact same sequence be a sheet in one protein and a helix in another protein. Um, and what really determines if it's a helix or a sheet, like this is the exact same amino acid sequence and is different in, in these two different conditions is that um, it's, it's all about the, the context, who, who are your neighbors? And so it turns out if you actually look at the conservation information at every single position, you can then actually correctly predict that this is a sheet and this is a helix. Um, and, and so it turns out models like this also use this kind of information to potentially help you get the right structure. Um, and so something that happened in CASP11 is people start using this co-evolution context that I just described to you, and that helps in the, in the process of folding. Um, if you have templates, like you can steal, like let's say you could take the PSSM, search against the database of proteins, uh, and if you find anything relevant, you could combine these guys to create the structure. And people roughly characterize the problem into free modeling and template-based modeling. Um, and um, but well, for now, let's just focus on this uh, free modeling case where let's say you don't have any templates and you're just trying to predict the structure. Um, so one of the advancements in, in CAS 13 was to say, well, instead of going from a contact map and then folding a, a, up a structure, why don't we have a neural network that takes the information directly from these covolution models, uh, predicts the distances between every pair of residues, and then also predicts the hedrals in, in, the, in the backbone. And this is something maybe Mohammed will tell you guys a little bit about later because he, he's also been using the hedral predictions in a sort of end-to-end -end way of training models to predict structures. Um, and then you can minimize and find the structure that, that matches these constraints. Um, another innovation since then was to say, well, instead of predicting just the distances, can we also predict the angles and dihedrals between every pair of residues? And then the idea is like, then the, the structure is almost perfectly determined. Um, and then finally, what happened with alpha fold two, and I guess this is now we're getting to the relevant part, is that instead of trying to first extract covolution fish features, and then pass it to some neural network, and then getting some inter-residue angles and distances, and then minimizing and trying to get a structure that matches those distances, what they did is they trained a model effectively end-to-end -end that takes the multiple sequence alignment directly, uh, potentially initializes the coordinates, and it turns out in the case of alpha fold, they literally just initialize at zero, zero, zero. Uh, and then pass it to some structural module that gets you the structure, then you can take the structure, feed it back into the model and just keep repeating this procedure over and over and over. Um, but the other bit of information is that you could actually pass in templates. So if there's a protein that's been previously solved that's really, really similar to you, you could pass that to the model and, and that can actually assess, assist in the structure prediction. Um, so, so the big picture here is that the model still uses uh, multiple sequence alignment and still uses templates to make the predictions. This is both the case for Rosetta Fold 2 Sorry, uh, alpha fold two and Rosetta fold. Um, this is just a, a picture of the whole architecture, and we won't really spend too much time on it because I think we unfortunately we don't have too much time. So we'll, we'll just we'll just keep this as our mental image for now. Uh, and, and alpha and Rosetta fold also has a very similar architecture. Um, okay, so now 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 I guess the thing that you probably most care about is like what exactly is this model doing? So so this right here is our alpha fold model. We have some kind of model that process the uh, multiple sequence alignment. We have a model that outputs the structure and the inputs to the model is a single sequence that you want to predict, a multiple sequence alignment of related sequences, uh, templates if you have any, uh, and then the outputs of the model are the coordinates, which is all what we all care about, um, but it also outputs uh, a prediction of the distances or the contact map, which could be quite useful if let's say, let's say if you wanted to do some large scale runs and you don't want to do the structure module part, you can technically cut this out and get these outputs much faster, but also you can get probabilities for every pair of positions, which could be useful as another confidence metric. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is it also outputs a multiple sequence alignment, which is like the same information, the same information out. Um, and, and that could potentially be used for like mutant effect prediction because uh, what, what, what the model was actually trained to do is that they would mass positions out here and then try to predict the mass positions and so you could technically use these kind of models for, for mutant screening, uh, not, not mutant screening like by looking at the confidence, but looking at how the MSA is affected. So it's effectively a sort of an unsupervised, uh, um, uh, self-supervised model. Um, but okay, but now let's move on to the confidence because I think, I mean, we all know that AlphaFold returns structures, but the other really, really important thing that it returns are actually these confidence metrics. Um, so one of these confidence metric is this local confidence called PLDDT. Um, and it's scaled between zero and 100. 
And inside collab fold, well, if you run collab fold, it will return to you two things. It will return to you a structure colored by this confidence metric, but also will return this kind of plot that shows the PLDT at every single position. So alpha fold actually returns five models. Uh, two of the models use template information and the other three don't use template information. Uh, it turns out sometimes you can get slightly better structure by not biasing by template. Uh, in this case, um, it, it returned five models. Two of them used templates, two, uh, three of them didn't, and they're all pretty confident. Um, and this is a very, very useful metric. So if you want to sort of tell you like, how confident are you at each position? Um, but it turns out that this metric should not be the only one you look, look at. Um, even though this is like the main matrix, uh, it's actually not the best metric that AlphaFold returns. And the, and the reason why this is important is I illustrated in the next slide. So for example, imagine here, here's now a much larger protein and it has two domains in it, this domain and this domain, and it's very, very confident. And if, you, if, if I told you this PLDT, it's, it's very, very, almost very high at the cutoff. Uh, and, but the question is like, are you actually confident about this, how these domains are arranged relative to each other? Because based on the PLDT, you, you would say, okay, this is probably where this protein goes and this is where this other domain goes. But in reality, AlphaFold has no idea like how these two domains are, are oriented relative to each other. And the way we'd know that is by looking at this other metric called PAE, predicted alignment error. So for every pair of positions, you get a value between zero and 30, which is in an angstrom range. Um, and so me zero means that it's very, very confident about that pair of positions. So for example, here's the protein and it's about 700 in length. And so the first domain, it's really, really confident about everything in that domain. It's also very, very confident everything in that domain, but it's actually not confident about the interactions between these two domains. Um, and, and so, this is becomes really, really important because let's say you look at your protein and, and you, and just by chance, similar to how you would get like with, with T-SNE or UMAP, you have two things coming close together and you're like, wait, is that real? Or is that just because it had to place it somewhere? So it placed it there. Turns out AlphaFold has the exact same problem. It will just place density in random locations um, if they don't, because we need to place them somewhere. But then if you want to know how confident it is actually about the placement role of the, of these bits of density, the PAE values become really, really important. And it turns out these PAE values are summarized in this other metric that collapse fold returns is this PTM score, the predicted TM score. Uh, so it's a between zero and one. So in this case, the PLDT is 89, the TM score is 57. Um, and so if we go back to this other example here, the PLDT is really high, the PTM is also relatively high and you see everything is blue. So here we know like, hey, AlphaFold is confident about every single position, but also is very confident for every pair of positions. Um, and so, so this is something I just wanted to stress is that I think some people only look at this information and, and they would look and say, hey, I'm really confident about the whole protein. It looks really good on average, but in reality, it's only confident about the individual domains, but not confident at all about the, the, the interactions between the domains. Um, so all this information is available. You can run it directly online, uh, but also I guess you maybe also hear in the next talk, CollabFold has also been set up to run on, on our current cluster. So you should be able to also get all this information out. Um, so for every single protein, you can get out these PLDBT metrics, which tell you about confidence at each position for every pair of positions. But another uh, plot that comes out, which is kind of useful is these MSA plots. Uh, so, so what these plots are showing here is that, so at every single position, how many sequences are there? Um, if you're lucky, this whole thing will be filled in. It'll be thousands of thousands of sequences, but sometimes you might get some scenarios where there's a bunch of sequences that, that cover one part of the protein, but only but other sequences that only cover half the protein. Uh, and so this metric sort of tells you, okay, at every position, how much information there is. So it turns out AlphaFold is really, really dependent on having all these sequences because of this covolution information. Uh, and so if your protein fails, you might wonder, why does it fail? It might fail because you just didn't get enough sequences in your multiple sequence alignment. And so here we kind of try to summarize that information using these uh, uh, MSA plots where the black line just tells you how many sequences there are at each position. The color of these lines tell you how, how far away is that sequence relative to the query sequence, like the main sequence you want to model. Uh, and so you could sort of see that information about, and these are two different examples. Um, actually, one thing I could quickly show you is that that one example that I just showed you that didn't make a really good prediction. Um, so, I mean, just to give you a quick demo, so like alpha fold, uh, sorry, collab fold, you, you send in the sequence, um, you will get back these plots, these structures colored by PLDDT. Uh, you'll get back structures also colored by PLDDT. 
Um, you can ask it to show you side chains um, and it'll, it'll show you where the side chains are um, and so on. Uh, and then for, for because it, what happens, it returns five different models. And so you can click on each one of these guys um, and each model has like a PLDDT score, the PTM score. And so in this case, we can see the PTM score are actually quite low. Um, and so even though we trust maybe the individual domains, we may not trust necessarily the full protein. Uh, so if we keep scrolling down, um, and, and I'm guessing the server will also output all these graphs. So, so in this particular example, this is kind of interesting because it found a whole bunch of sequences for the first domain. It found a whole bunch of sequences for the second domain, but it actually didn't find any sequences that cover both domains. And so this might be the reason why it was not able to predict that domain domain interaction because maybe it couldn't find any covolution information or, or interactions between those two proteins. I mean, those two domains of that protein. And so, so this, this kind of plot can tell you what kind of sequences it's looking at. Um, I guess, uh, I'm running a little bit of time uh, out of time, but I just wanted to maybe summarize quickly. So some things that uh, the collab full allows you to do is it, it, it's able to make multiple sequence alignments really, really fast within minutes instead of hours compared to the default alpha fold uh, notebook. Um, allows you to do protein protein complexes, uh, both sort of like the original model where people sort of try to hack alpha fold to predict protein protein complexes. Turns out sometimes that still works better for some systems. And so we offer both of those options. Like you can predict multimers using the hacked version or the non-hacked version. Uh, the other thing is you can increase number of recycles because it turns out that iterating, you can sometimes get better predictions. Uh, but the other thing that's I think is kind of exciting is you can enable dropouts and, and just tell the model, just keep making as many models as you can, like how much time you have. And it'll actually give you back a whole bunch of structures. In this particular example, this protein has multiple conformations. And by sim simply iterating through different seeds, you can actually get an ensemble of conformations. In this case, you actually end up predicting both states of this protein. Um, often, it, it doesn't always work because sometimes like happens, the covolution is really, really important and it just sort of keeps you fixed in. Um, but you can somehow, by decreasing the number of sequences, which is another option we provide, you can do uh, a lot of interesting stuff. And finally, you can bias the model in different ways um, with templates or a custom to say. All right, well, I think I'm out of time. Um, I have some of this stuff about unintended uses, but I, I can, we could save those for discussion if, if no one has discussion points. All right, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sergey, for that excellent presentation. And apologies again for the repeated dings in the first 10 minutes of, the, of, of your talk. Um, this is actually a very good segue into the next talk, um, which will be uh, me and uh, research computing um, talking about AlphaFold and ColabFold and how to run these things on O2. So uh, as Sergey really nicely pointed out or, or described, he described AlphaFold. Um, and then at the end, he described another implementation of AlphaFold called ColabFold, which both run on the same models. So uh, this is essentially what AlphaFold does, right? Uh, on the left, you have sequences, um, uh, or you have like a protein sequence for which you're interested in the structure for, or um, one thing of high interest in the past several months has been, uh, I have a, a hypothesized protein complex. So I have a sequence for protein A and a sequence for protein B. And I'm interested to see if uh, AlphaFold can predict the structure of that complex. Uh, so uh, in these next few slides, we're going to go through examples of how to uh, actually use O2 to uh, predict the structure of a protein complex, but you can also use uh, these tools to predict the structure of a single protein. And so, uh, currently, uh, we have uh, AlphaFold and ColabFold, and I'll explain what the difference is in a bit. Um, uh, I'm up and running on O2, we're going to explain how to run these programs uh, in collaboration with Research Computing, and I'll give you a couple of caveats and tips. And then at the end, we'll talk about a couple of projects that we've been working on at the CCB using these tools. So um, this is a bit of a review recap from the past 20 minutes, but essentially we have um, Google's group DeepMind came out with AlphaFold 2. A couple of years ago, the source code, source code for it was released about a year ago. And, um, and that was, okay, how can we go for, from a single protein sequence to the structure of that protein? And then um, a, a few months later, people started kind of taking this DeepMind AlphaFold 2 code, um, hacking it, so to speak, to uh, try to predict the structure of complexes. And, um, and then DeepMind came back and said, actually, we're gonna retrain some of these models on some different training data. And then they came out with this updated uh, DeepMind AlphaFold multimer um, uh, algorithm or set of algorithms. 
and um, and, and that was kind of to be used to predict the structure of a protein complex. So when I when I say DeepMind AlphaFold, I'm referring to uh, DeepMind's implementation of AlphaFold or OG AlphaFold, so to speak. Um, but then um, Sergey and several other people put together uh, this thing called ColabFold, which runs on the same models, uh, but also does a few things differently that speeds up the computation process and the computational resources required to run these predictions. So when I say DeepMind AlphaFold, I'm referring to uh, you know Google's thing, the OG, and then uh, when I say Colabfold, I'm, I'm referring to, uh, to to Colabfold, and both of these things are currently up and running on O2. So uh, with that, I will let um, RC take it away, and I just want to briefly introduce them. So uh, two of the research uh, computing consultants that uh, we've been working with extensively over the past several months to get this up and running on the cluster. Alex Strong and Calvin Cox are research computing consultants that work for RC. Their role is to assist users of all levels of proficiency with getting their research done on O2. They and other RC consultants are available for consultations and help via office hours or by appointment. Um, and with that, I'll let you two take it away. Cool. Thank you, Roger. Uh, you should be able to hear and see me. So I'll go ahead and start. That is correct. All right, cool, cool. Thank you. All right, so generally, AlphaFold takes fewer parameters than ColabFold. It uses Jackhammer for multiple sequence alignment. On the other hand, ColabFold uses mm 62 for MSA generation, as you heard before, and is on average about five times faster than AlphaFold. The GitHub repo and O2 wiki for both folding applications are found on the slide deck, which we'll be sharing with you. Next slide, please. Cool. So both applications accept FASTA files for protein sequences as input. Uh, in the example shown for AlphaFold on the top right, we see that the FASTA file format contains two headers. Uh, both sequences will be used to generate one overarching set of predictions. ColabFold does the same thing using one header and separating the sequences by a colon inline as shown in the bottom right of the slide within the yellow circle. For AlphaFold, all sequences in the FASTA file are considered subunits. In ColabFold, each header in the FASTA file will be considered its own independent input with its own set of predictions. This allows you to make more predictions per job in a batch fashion. And I'll now turn it over to Alex. Next slide, please. Thanks, Calvin. Um, hopefully, you know, I have a history of my mic being on the fritz for a few things, so let me know if I start fading in and out. Um, so on this slide, we have basically two example batch scripts that, you, that uh, would indicate possible uh, methods of job submission on, on O2. The top one is for AlphaFold, and the second one on the bottom is for ColabFold. Um, you, you might notice that they are incredibly similar, uh, and this is kind of like your typical job submission process for submitting any sort of job in O2, in fact. So we've customized these uh, particular screenshots with how you might access uh, either AlphaFold or ColabFold. So we've made them available via our module system, um, which you can you know, simply type you know, module load and unload just to make them available or unavailable inside your environment as necessary. Um, we also, our friends with uh, BioGrids and SPGrids have uh, these programs available as well in their own software offering. So if you're in that environment already, um, you don't need to leave per se. So the main thing we actually want to uh, emphasize here is you know, the resource requirement, right? Um, as mentioned previously, AlphaFold uh, tends to use significantly more computational resources um, than ColabFold. And these values that we've indicated here on the slide um, are actually what we have kind of empirically determined to be best practices for allowing the, the highest likelihood of your job successfully completing on the cluster. Um, there, there might be opportunities or rather occasions where you might need to tweak these values further, um, but this is what we have found in our own internal testing to be um, gen generally successful. And again, these are, these are templates. Um, you don't have to look too closely at them. Uh, these templates are actually in more detail on our, um, yes, there should be flags for a number of cycles. I believe. So yeah, uh, just, just uh, to clarify, there should be uh, more detail going into these, these templates and how to submit these jobs directly on the wiki pages um, that are on the previous slides. 
And if you would like to look more into kind of a general method of job submission, we've also provided a link here on the slide itself. Um, I guess it's also worth noting that um, for those of you that uh, noticed um, our, I guess, flavor of uh, collab fold here is local collab which is actually just sort of a repackaging of collab folds to be more friendly to non Google collab environments. So your typical sort of HPC localized environments. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So this, this slide is just a quick overview of just kind of what happens when you submit a collab fold job on the cluster. So you have your typical fast to file input with your amino acid sequences, and this input gets shipped over to uh, the remote MMCX2 server, where MMCX2 executes and you know, generates multiple sequence alignment. That result then gets shipped back to the compute node on which the job is running. And that is the location slash GPU where your predictions will be generated. And then you know, it will create the outputs and such. Um, we currently have a vision slash you know medium term goal to make the msa generation step happen locally so that we would not necessarily need to be reliant on this remote server um, because you know, this has various ramifications for the volume that you're able to submit and sort of the efficiency uh, of your research um, since you know this is not directly controlled um, by our administrators or anything like that. So we are hoping to have a solution in place for this uh, this summer. And you know, uh, we will hopefully be able to send out a, a communication when that is ready. Um, but you know, fingers crossed for that. In the meantime, we ask that you, if you uh, begin to fool around with uh, this software on O2, on our cluster, uh, that you don't submit in too high volume. Unfortunately, we're not really able to quantify how much is too much but we, we'll, we trust you guys to use your best judgment on that. Um, finally, uh, there's just a few caveats uh, with the current state of collab fold. Um, there will be occasions where some jobs will fail um, if you are going to attempt to use Amber relaxation or run against the template. Um, if that is the case, uh, you can try to rerun them um, and also just omit those flags. Um, in the worst case, or if you absolutely need these features, um, kind of as a last resort, we suggest you kind of attempt to run against the alpha fold and see what happens as those features are also implemented in alpha fold. Um, but yeah, I will then now hand it back to Roger for kind of the wrap up and some CCB context. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank, thank you, Alex. Uh, that was very helpful. Okay, so uh, let's we, we run alpha fold, we run Carl fold on this protein complex that we're interested in. What's the actual output? What does the structure of that directory look like? And so that's essentially what I'm gonna talk about on this slide. So uh, here on the left, you have um, uh, this, the output of what a run on DeepMind's alpha fold looks like for a given protein complex. Um, and in here, you end up getting actually five different predicted structures. So alpha fold and collab fold will both spit out five different predictions corresponding to five different models, regardless of whether you run this for a single protein or protein complex. And so uh, you actually have to look at some of the output to determine uh, which is the best uh, structure, uh, the best predicted structure from those five. And when you look at DeepMind Alpha Fold's output directory, uh, you look for this file called rank underscore zero. That's going to be your best structure. And in order to get the metrics corresponding to that structure, uh, you actually have to look at these pickled files here. That has things, the PLDDT score, the PAE score that Sergey was talking about. And in order to figure out which one of these five different pickled files corresponds to this best ranked structure, you have to look at this ranking underscore debug.json file. And that'll give you the ranking of the mapping from which um, from which model corresponds to the best ranking. Um, and that's how you can get and make these, uh, these maps like the particular alignment error that Sergey was talking about er earlier and this PLDDT score uh, that uh, Sergey also mentioned that gives you some idea of how confident these predicted structures are. And so um, what we also did at the CCB was we looked at this tool um, called IUPRED2A, which gives you some um, indication of whether a given region of a protein is disordered or not. It gives you a score, uh, depending on whether it thinks it's gonna be uh, a disordered region or not. 
Uh, typically, we would see uh, disordered regions as you wouldn't be able to uh, have good prediction in that specific region, so you would get bad alignment metrics. And so sometimes you'll get like a bad alignment um, or you'll get like a streak of bad predicted alignment error um, in this in this heat map, but it actually it might correspond to just um, uh, a, an intrinsically disordered region. How do I know if it's intrinsically disordered or not? I can actually pull the score from this IU Pred2 server. So that's what's ma mapped back here. It's a score from zero to one. One being like very likely this is disordered region, zero being this is not likely disordered. Okay, uh, so that's DeepMind Alpha Fold, um, and that's how you can get the metrics is from these pickled files. And then, and then Colab Fold also spits out again your five different predictions. Um, you look for this file that's like underscore rank one in the middle of the file name, um, and then underscore model, underscore whatever model that was, and then dot PDB. So that is going to end up being your best ranked model. Um, and, um, and to get uh, some of these metrics, you go to this JSON file for that corresponding model, and that'll give you the PLDDT. Um, NumPy array and, or array, and it'll give you the PAE array. So you can get those metrics from those files as well. Um, and then um, as Sergey was mentioning earlier, uh, using a Google, Google, both Google Colab implementation or the O2 implementation, you get these, uh, these plots automatically generated of the PLDDT for all five models and the predicted alignment error for all five models. So you can just see that off the bat, or you can load them from this JSON file and plot them yourself. Um, and I just want to reiterate why, why we're even mentioning both of these tools as being installed on O2. Um, we would recommend that people use Colab Fold first because it takes less resources to run. But for some reason that your prediction fails on Colab Fold, you could also try it on DeepMind Alpha Fold as well. So it's more of like a like a backup option, or if you wanna uh, if you wanna run it on both, if you have a, a structure that you're really really interested in and you wanna make sure that the results are consistent between both programs, you can do that. Um, but we would push people to use Colab Fold first because it requires less um, less computing resources, and we want to make sure that. We, uh, we share those computing resources with our HMS community. So I only have a few minutes here, but I just wanna talk uh, briefly about some of the stuff we've been doing at the CCB um, with Colab Fold. Now that we've had it up and running on O2, we've been experimenting and testing on it over the past couple of months. Um, one of the ideas that we had um, in collaboration and, and talks with some other structural biologists in the community was to create a database of hypothesized homodimers or homotrimers. And so here the idea is, we just take um, human proteins, um, a first pass, maybe stick to the ones that are smaller in sequence length because those run faster and, um, and just run two copies of them and call that fold or run three copies of them and call that fold and see if we can uh, find uh, uh, structures for homodimers or homotrimers that may not be known. And so uh, we did this for 986 different human proteins. These are for, for homodimers. So to 986 human proteins, and through two copies of each human protein in a FASTA file, and then ran that through Colab Fold. And as Sergey was mentioning, at the end of the day, um, you get a lot of different metrics that gives you some idea of the accuracy of the predictions. Uh, but the one overarching one that you can look at quickly um, is the PTM score, uh, which takes the value from zero to one. The closer to one, the better that prediction is. The closer to zero, the worse that prediction is. And so this is the distribution of PTM scores for all 986 predictions. So it looks like a normal distribution. And if you look at some of these uh, ones that are um, have very high PTM scores, um, I just took an example. It was this ENO1 with itself. It forms. It looks like it forms this very nice homodimer. And then I actually searched for it in PDB and I got what looked like the same structure back. So this is not a new finding per se, but it is some verification that uh, we can pull back some homodimers that we already know just by running it through uh, through Colab Fold. And again, you can plot the metrics here to kind of visualize uh, what, the, what the accuracy looks like. Here I have this very high PLDDT score across the whole complex. And, um, and I have very good, a very low predicted alignment error across the whole complex because it's all blue. Um, we also have been doing this, uh, you know, we did this for homotrimers as well. Um, the homotrimer PTM distribution is, is a little lower on average than homodimer distribution. So we did this for the same human proteins, the same 986. And we, uh, we ran that through Colab Fold with three copies of each human protein. And we get this distribution back. Um, we took some of, a look at some of the ones that had higher PTM scores. And this is just one of the examples. Um, it looks like this forms this nice homotrimer and we saw what looked like the same structure from PDB. So again, uh, just kind of some verification, uh, external verification that this is uh, this is working the way we expect it to for, for homotrimers that are homotrimers. Um, and again, we're able to visualize 
uh, both the PLDDT score and the PAE score by just pulling from those files that I was mentioning earlier. And I just wanna point out here what I was, something that I alluded to earlier. Um, so here, for example, you'll see that like right at the beginning of this uh, protein sequence, you have a, a dip in the PLDDT, which corresponds to these red streaks in the, in the predicted alignment error. So it really high predicted alignment error. Uh, and it looks like the corresponds to regions that might be intrinsically disordered, or at least are predicted to be intrinsically disordered. So that's why we're we're plotting this uh, this intrinsically disordered score at the bottom as well, uh, as it might explain why we have some of um, some of these red streaks. Uh, but overall, the structure looks very nice. Okay, um, there is another project that I was going to talk about, but we're kind of running a little bit on time, so I think I'm just going to skip it. Um, we are going to email everyone out with a link to the slides uh, to the CCB website and the recording later, so you'll have access to that and you can always feel free to email me if you have any further questions on this. But at now, at this point, I would actually like to acknowledge um, everyone that's worked on this, even though we're not at the end of the presentation, we still have, or this, this goes till 3.30, but this is the, the part where I talk. So I just wanna acknowledge the hard work that everyone has put into getting these things up and running on the computing cluster. Um, I first wanna thank our speakers, um, Sergey, Mohammed, and Jason. Mohammed and Jason are going to talk with us shortly. Um, for joining us today uh, amongst the hectic schedules. Brilliant, brilliant people who I'm very thankful that they're sharing their insight with us today. And then I'd like to thank the people that have worked on this in the CCB, um, Tyrone, Sunil, Ludwig, Robert, and Jacqueline for helping uh, put all of this together, this town hall, and for generating ideas on how to, uh, to push a lot of this collab fold out full stuff forward, both from the infrastructure side and the project side. Um, thank you so much for research computing. Um, a special shout out to Alex, Calvin, and Amir who have uh, done a lot to get this up and running on the computing cluster in a way that's very easy for people um, in the HMS community to access and run their own predictions. And then, um, and for all the talks with, with Edward Hutland and, and Piotr and Andrew Crusay and Kelly Brock and Wade Harper, um, it's been very helpful getting everyone's insight in the structural biology community HMS. So thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us today. This is not the end of the talk. We still have till 3.30, but this is just where I decided to, to mention the acknowledgements and, um, and thank everyone for their input and their, and their help on this and getting this up off the ground. So at this point for the next 10 or so minutes, uh, we can have a discussion or we can, we can take questions um, that, that people might uh, be urging to ask. Okay, I see one hand. Uh, Tomer, go for it. Hey, Roger. Uh, great talk so far. I was wondering, you did all the homodimer and heterodimers, et cetera. Have you ever tried to do um, proteins and substrates, like kinase and substrates or binding motifs? Would that, be, would that work for that as well? So we haven't tried that. And, um, and there are experts on here, so please chime in if I'm saying something crazy. Um, but I don't know if it would necessarily work because uh, one of the basic main inputs into alpha fold and collab fold is the multiple sequence alignment. Um, so it basically searches these databases and creates a multiple sequence alignment for these, uh, for these proteins. Um, and I don't think that at least the models were trained on this type of data as well. So I don't think it would work as well, um, but uh, someone feel free to correct me on that. If no one has any input on that, then uh, let's, I guess we can move on to the next question. Thanks. Uh, yep. Uh, okay, let's go with, I think John Steedman, I saw your hand up first. Uh, you're, you're muted, uh, John. Sorry, can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, sorry. So um, th those were nice presentations and thank you, but I may have missed this. Um, Presumably, the, the compute time is in, related to the length of the sequence in a nonlinear way. Do you know what the relationship is? Like, what's a re if you take shorter sequences, presumably the compute time is dramatically less than longer ones. But do you have a function like that? Uh, th that is, yeah, so that's generally right. Um, the longer the sequence, the longer the runtime. But I don't exactly know what the relationship is. Uh, so I... What I can I, tell I can you pipe is in if you want. <laughs> Sorry, Perfect. It, yes, please do. It, it depends on the components. Some components are quadratic. Some ones are some are cubic. Um, generally speaking, the, the the quadratic terms dominate. So unless you have a very 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 long thing, then the cubic might. But but generally speaking, it's the the quadratic that dominates. And so and, and what are what size range are you? What amino acid length are you talking about 
as like for these, say, say for a one hour run? The, the, the dominant term is not the, the, the time actually, it's more the memory. So okay. I think for, for conventional outfall with conventional, you know, uh, regular O2 class GPUs, let's say, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably on the order of maybe 1500 residues, something like that. Oh, okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we'll take two more questions. I see Johannes and Jacqueline. So we'll go with Johannes first. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess I have a related question, and that is, how can you push the limit of the, you know, of the of the input? So you know, we have like a a ten subunit protein complex has probably seven thousand amino acids, and we're trying to dock proteins onto that. Understand how they fold with that. Is is that just completely unrealistic, or is there a way to to tackle that? Yeah, so you're going to run into two problems from the way I see it. You're going to run into uh, runtime. Um, and if you're trying to run this on O2, uh, you have a five-day runtime limit using the GPUs. So if, it, if you have something that's going to take a long time to predict um, and it hits the five-day runtime limit, then you're going to have an issue trying to get that job to finish. Um, you're also going to maybe run into memory error uh, or memory usage uh, limits. And I think right now, you can request 240 gigabytes of RAM per job, uh, something like that. And RC, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so if, you're, if your protein complex is, is too big um, and requires too many resources, then that's, that's gonna be your primary constraint. Um, and and I, 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 was, I was testing this for like DeepMind's AlphaFold and also ColabFold. And I found that um, I ran into these limits much faster with, um, with DeepMind's implementation of AlphaFold. Um, so I don't know, for your specific example, if you can maybe modify the structure um, or like start off with the whole full thing. And then if you think that there are sub units of it that would form um, nicely, a complex nicely, then you can try um, taking pieces of it out and then running it with uh, smaller and smaller inputs. You could try that. Um, but if, if you're dead set on running this huge, huge thing um, and, and you hit the limits of, of what O2 can do, uh, then I don't know how to, uh, how to how you would push that further at the moment. Um, I can chime in a little bit here. So the, the, the system I'm going to describe does let you go much higher. Um, I, I think we'll get to 7,000 residues, although I can't yet confirm, but, but, but certainly much more than, uh, than Define slash, like, you know, the, the Define implementation or, or call-up poll, which is based on Define implementation would, would, would go. Oh, fantastic. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks, Thank so, you. Thanks, Mohammed. Okay, so, so that's the answer is to come in a couple of minutes when Mohammed gives his presentation. Um, okay, Jacqueline? Yep. Um, so I just have a quick question about um, the predictions, and, and please feel free to say if this is too technical for the scope of the town hall. Um, but so uh, perhaps this is for Sergey. How, how are you those predictions being made? Is it based off of, like, as someone suggested in the chat? in the chat uh, previous oligomer structures is based off of protein charge i mean as we all know here protein structure and function can vary immensely not just by amino acid sequence but also by the environment that the protein is in and um then also you mentioned that uh there was a homodimer i believe that you said that was like a new structure or new binding that wasn't found before so then how does that get used for future applications does that information get used to inform other structures later on? Um, just wondering about that. Yeah, so, I mean, from what we tell, like the biggest signal is coming from the covolution information in the multiple sequence alignment. Um, and that's where the big signal comes from. But besides that, even when you're lacking covolution, sometimes you still get the right structure. Um, and it's still kind of puzzling why that works. Um, I think one of the hypotheses is that it may have learned to identify sort of a common uh, binding uh, motifs. Uh, so like maybe on the surface, there might be like convex and a concave kind of thing. Um, and, and so the idea there is like, even when you train on single chains, uh, when you make predictions, you might still see those things because they appear in like domain domain interactions. Um, but I, on, I guess on a more technical level, um, right now the templates that are provided are only provided for each protein individually. And how they get assembled together is the base of the prediction. So that, so that, so the the actual um, uh, how do you say the the template for the complex is not actually provided as input. So it's not using that information. See, thank you. Awesome. Great, thank you, Sergey. Okay, so it's two fifty, which means uh, our next talk is now up. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Qurashi. Uh, Dr. Mohammed holds undergraduate degrees 
in biology, computer science, and mathematics. He earned an MS in statistics and a PhD in genetics from Stanford University. Mohammed subsequently joined the systems biology department at Harvard Medical School as a department fellow and a fellow in systems pharmacology, where he developed the first end-to-end -end differentiable model for learning protein structure from data. Currently, Mohammed is an assistant professor in the Department of Systems Biology at Columbia University and a member of Columbia's Program for Mathematical Genomics, where he works at the intersection of machine learning, biophysics, and systems biology. And he'll be presenting OpenFold, a trainable implementation of AlphaFold. I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. Take it away, Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much. Let me try sharing my screen, make sure it works. Uh, can you all see it? Yep. Great, fantastic. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I spent quite a bit of time at HMS, so this feels like a, a virtual visit back home, which is which is great. Um, uh, so I'm going to tell you about, about OpenFold today, which is a, a trainable implementation of AlphaFold. I thought actually since I know there's a lot of acronyms going around, so maybe or a lot of terms going around, so maybe it's Helps a little bit to kind of break down the very the, the differences between these systems. So, you know, the kind of the thing that started all of this is AlphaFold, which was which was a DeepMind system uh, that came that was sort of debuted at, at Cast fourteen uh, almost two years ago now. Um, uh, ColopFold, which 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 was Sergey described, is essentially sort of a wrap around uh, around AlphaFold that that uh, you know tunes various things differently as we hear it in terms of MMC two and so on uh, as far as the MSA search and and present, presents sort of a more user friendly interface through uh, through through uh, Google Colab. Um, Rosetta Fold is a, is a completely different model, sort of inspired by AlphaFold, but it's really a completely different architecture um, and and it, it has sort of own kind of you know. Uh, Trades and trades uh, trade offs, I suppose, relative to, to AlphaFold. What I'm going to talk about today is is um, a sort of a new implementation of OpenFold. So this is a, of AlphaFold. So this is a completely new code base that is and I, that is meant to be identical to the original AlphaFold. So unlike RosettaFold, this is not a different model. This is the same exact model, but implemented from scratch, and in particular implemented in a way that allows training of this model uh, from from scratch as well. So uh, DeepMind was very generous in terms of what they, you know, in terms of having released the 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 code for for AlphaFold to allow people to make predictions. Uh, but that code uh, lacked the train the training component, if you may. Um, so it so it didn't permit training new versions of, of, of AlphaFold. Uh, and so th this is what 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 this system is sort of meant to address. Or at least this was sort of initially our motivation for for what this is meant to address. But as I'll talk about in a moment, um, I, I think now we sort of we're going beyond that. Okay, so so let's get going. So let me let me first start out with why 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 do we want a trainable version of AlphaFold? Um, so, so initially, has sort of four initial motivations. I would say um, the first was sort of full scale training uh, of the system. Right. So if we if we want to tackle new applications, uh, it sort of might make sense to essentially train a new version on data. Uh, and and it is, so, so that's one thing. Um, the other is modular components. So we want to be able to uh, to break up uh, AlphaFold into various pieces that could be reused in different in different systems. And in particular, here um, the one one thing to note is that the original sort of framework that Alpha was implemented in the DeepMind one. Uh, is is in JAX, which is uh, you know a particular sort of framework. Um, there's a competing one called PyTorch, which is I, I would argue sort of more broadly used by the community. At least it's more it's more sort of popular anyway. Um, there are questions about, about which is better, which, which I might get back get uh, get to, to the very end. Um, and so uh, so you know part of our our kind of let's say uh, motivation here was to say it, it would be nice to, to have a, a PyTorch implementation of AlphaFold so that people can use it in their existing models essentially. Um, a third point was that you know we wanted to, to be able to sort of acquire the knowledge, frankly, just to, to you know to, to see that we could actually train this from scratch and be able to produce DeepMind's results because these I mean while DeepMind had provided this model for us to use, uh, there's not been kind of a, a public reproduction there. There still hasn't been of, of the system, and so, so we thought that would be a, a worthwhile thing. Um, and then the final thing what, was that we wanted to provide the, the kind of model weights in, in a way that's just sort of freely licensable for commercial use so that companies can use it. Uh, this was one of the initial motivations, but, but actually soon after uh, DeepMind released the, uh, AlphaFold, they, they, they went ahead and changed the, the license for it to be commercially uh, usable. So, so that, that sort of is no longer really a, a, motivating, a motivating factor. Um, okay, so let me just kind of walk you through a couple of these and, and why, why we think it's sort of worthwhile. So um, one example of this, of, of why we want to train a new model from scratch is actually AlphaFold Meltimer. Um, so, so this is, a, this is the, the AlphaFold Meltimer paper from DeepMind. And, and what you see here are a handful of models here, the, the ones in the kind of the bottom, and the performance on, on this metric called DOCQ, which assesses how well they, they, they do, what do at predicting complexes. And, and all these models essentially use the original AlphaFold, but sort of tweaked it in various ways to, to, get, the, to, to get new predictions. Um, and, and as such, they, um, they, they actually, I mean, I have, I have to say they work remarkably well, um, 
but, but it, they had a certain, a certain say, score, right? a certain performance, which is maybe around here, 0.48 or something like this. Uh, when DeepMind essentially took a you know, very similar idea to these approaches and, and simply retrained it from scratch on new data, uh, on complex data, um, not surprisingly, they saw a rather substantial boost in performance, right? And so, so this is really kind of the key thing is that by simply taking the same architecture and just retrain essentially the same architecture and retraining it on new data, they saw a substantial performance boost. And so, so this sort of speaks to the idea that being able to train new versions of AlphaFold is worthwhile, but perhaps, you know, on, on various kinds of uh, specialized data, if you may. Uh, sorry, yeah, so this is the point here that this, this was the only trained one and none of these models had any kind of retraining uh, procedure. Um, so that's for the full scale of training. Uh, but modular components also make sense. It makes sense to kind of break apart our fault too and use it in different ways. And we've, we've already seen, beginning to see this in, in various ways. So um, I, I, I like to get one kind of delve into the architecture because it's fairly complex. Um, but suffice it to say that there are a couple of components, in particular this MSA representation and the pair representation, which are uh, built up of, of fairly general purpose components. So for example, there is what's called this kind of triangular or triangular attention scheme, which essentially uh, looks at sort of three residues at a time and tries to do various computations, various neural computations on those triplets of residues. Um, these kinds of primitives are, are broadly useful for any kind of molecular or geometric reasoning. Um, and so it stands to reason that, that these kinds of things would be, would be usable in, in other schemes. Um, and sure enough, we've actually already, I've already, I've already seen this. So um, there was just a preprint came out very recently from uh, Yang Jiang's group at the University of Michigan, which essentially um, uses the alpha parts of the alpha fold two architecture to do RNA structure prediction, kind of fused actually with the alpha fold one architecture uh, to, to do this. Uh, I, I, they haven't released a code, so I actually don't know if they've used open fold. They might have, uh, but at least you know the principle stands that that sort of makes sense to to retool alpha fold two. Um, another another uh, sort of uh, preprint from from Jim Buzu's groups at University of Chicago, where they do inverse folding, where they go from the structure to the sequence, or they try to find a, a structure. And again, here you see some of those components like the outer product mean, the triangular attentions, and so on, which are which are uh, primitives that were that were there in, in alpha fold. Uh, now I should say, I mean, I mean, from the from the original Jackson implementation that DeepMind had, you could perfectly well use those components. Maybe they're not as modular as they are in OpenFold. Uh, the, the, the point here more is about the uh, beyond the modularity issue. It's about the the, the code base. The fact this is PyTorch based. And so at least in principle, more, more amenable to integration. Um, and then another, uh, just one more example is, uh, is this work from, from Stanford group on structure generation, on being able to sort of essentially hallucinate new structures. Here too, it uses this thing called IPA, which is a, a component of the structure module in alpha fold two to do, uh, to, 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 to do, to do its, uh, its to achieve its objective. Um, so, 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 so that's the sort of for, for kind of the two main ones. And like I said, you know, on, on this one, it was really just more about being able to, to, to prove that this process that was described in the paper actually works because it was always possible that some details were left out that was sort of key ingredients. And, and we, didn't, we didn't know that until we sort of went through the process of retaining the model. Um, so let me tell you where we are at today. So, so it's kind of a multi-stage process. So the first stage, which has been, which has been done for, for a few months now, um, is a full again, re-implementation of our full 2.0.1, including the training code, as, as, I, as I alluded to. Uh, we also have an implementation of the inference code of our full Multimer. Uh, again, this is, as I said, it's a fresh new implementation all, all in PyTorch. Um, and uh, you know, one thing to note here is that, I have to say, that the credit to this goes entirely to Gustav, who's sort of been leading the effort in my group. Um, the, the implementation is of such high fidelity that if you take the AlphaFold 2 parameters, the ones that DeepMind trained, and then stick them into OpenFold, right, which is a completely different implementation, completely, completely different framework, running on GPUs versus TPUs and so on, and then um, running, running it through the model, you actually get the exact same structure. Right? So, so this implementation is really high fidelity with respect to the original DeepMind implementation, which, which is, which is not too bland. It took quite a bit of work to get all of its kind of numerical issues sorted out to actually, to actually be able to do that. But that's nice because that means you don't need to, you don't need new weights. You don't need to train a new version. You could just use the PyTorch OpenFold using the AlphaFold 2 uh, parameters. Um, now stage two, which, which is nearly complete, um, is, is sort of a free, fresh free training of model OS, like I said. So train, that, train, train the model from scratch, um, and uh, whoops, and, and like I said, to kind of demonstrate full reproduction uh, capability. So, so how well does it work so far? And we, we're not quite done, but we're, we're, we're very much almost done. Uh, so this is this is sort of a kind of a scatter plot uh, where, you, where you're comparing the predictions from OpenFold versus OpenFold on this held out validation set from Cameo. Again, this is a completely fresh new model. And what basically what you say is that very highly correlated. The, the actual uh, the GDTS and RMSD scores are basically uh, equivalent. It's sort of it's within the noise. Uh, you know, in some cases. 
uh, open fold does better, like in this case, in some cases, uh, out fold does better, but, but that kind of random variability is, is to be expected just by kind of the stochasticity of the, of the, of the model and, and, the, and the training procedure. Uh, so, so, so we think we basically reach parity, uh, perfect parity with, with out fold. Um, and yeah, so, you know, just as a uh, kind of hammer home the point, this is a superposition of, of, a, of a, the ground truth in white and then the out fold and the deep and the open fold predictions. It doesn't matter what, what the color is because they're all perfectly superposed. So yeah, th this is probably one of those ones that are like right up right on the diagonal where you see the exact same uh, same prediction. Um, now, so like I said, you know, we started out with this sort of motivation about um, you know trainability and, and providing providing a tool for the community to be able to build and research new architectures and new models. Um, but as, as we sort of did this, uh, we, we discovered there are actually some essential low hanging fruit in terms of the influence characteristics, the, 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 the capability of the, of the model to do predictions, which go above and beyond what, what DeepMind has done. Uh, and this is a bit surprising in a way, um, but I think you know, for, from DeepMind's perspective, they were focused very much on CAST, on really kind of achieving, um, you know, on, on, on doing well on, from an accuracy perspective. But I think performance characteristics in terms of speed and, the, and memory consumption and so on was not a high, a high point uh, of priority for them. Um, so the first point is that the, the new open fold is actually uh, uh, faster than alpha fold too, maybe about 32% faster, although we're still quantifying this. Um, I should say this has nothing to do with the MSAs. I mean, the MSA thing obviously is, a, is an independent component. Um, and and as, as, as was mentioned earlier, call out faults, for example, impl implementation of that procedure is, is actually much faster than alpha fold twos. Uh, but here I'm talking about the actual influence, the, 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 the part which has to do with the predicting the, the structure using the neural components that, that comprise alpha fold two, uh, setting aside the, the MSA component. Um, uh, maybe more interestingly is that uh, we, we've we sort of uh, re repurposed this low, low memory attention from, from this paper that came out last year uh, in this new model, uh, which allows influence on much longer chains. Uh, so so it, it, we, could, we can currently do you know, 4,000 plus residues on sort of off the shelf uh, GPUs. Um, and, and, and we think we can push that uh, a fair bit further. We'll, we'll see though. Um, and so, so, and this is for single proteins as well as large complexes. And I should say this, this is strictly a function of the implementation. So uh, you could take the, the deep mind weights up for two weights, stick them into open fold and, and still get the same exact benefits in terms of influence speed, in terms of being able to apply this to much longer chains. So this is not really uh, tied to the new weights that, that, we, that we've trained. Um, one thing that we, we hope we'll be able to do as well is to, but, but this is not done yet, I should say. Uh, what, what I described above is, is done, um, is to, to essentially be able to trade speed for memory arbitrarily. Uh, so, so what this means is that if you're willing to kind of pay that quadratic or potentially cubic cost, um, you, 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 could, you could predict you know, 20,000 or 30,000 as you do complex, so long as you're willing to wait long enough. Um, and and that's, that's something you know, that, that, that I think we'll be able to achieve. It will, um, it will drive up the request. So obviously, you know, the, the, the rate, well, no, obviously, the, the, I should say the rate limiting step in, in all of these things is really the GPU memory. It's not the, 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 the main RAM that, that usually, I mean, well, setting aside the MSA component, main, main memory doesn't usually play much of a role here. It's really the, the, the GPU that, that's the critical rate limiting step. Um, so, so if we were to do this for, for number three, what would happen is that memory, CPU memory, becomes a, 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 a factor then. And so you, you might need quite a bit, you might need a terabyte of memory to be able to predict these very, very large complexes, but, that, but, but that's much more uh, doable than asking for a terabyte of GPU memory, which doesn't exist. Um, now the, the cost uh, the, the cost that we had have to pay for this is code complexity. So our original implementation, for example, of the triangular multiple Fixative update, sorry, uh, was just 10 lines of code. It was very simple, clean, similar to DeepMind's implementation. But now that we've sort of squeezed every bit of optimization out, it's more like 400 lines of code. So it is to, to make this as optimized as, as, as Gustav has managed to make it, it uh, had, had to involve quite a bit of uh, additional code complexity. Uh, we, we think it's a worthwhile trade off, but, but, it, but it, it is a trade off, obviously, that, that we've had to make. Um, so, so this is about the, the influence characteristics. It's not about training characteristics. Um, so maybe, sorry, th this might be a bit in the weeds, but I hope this is of interest to some people. Um, so training these models uh, generally requires what's called BF16 precision training. So this is a particular kind of uh, way to do the numerical calculations. Um, I should say, you know, one thing to note here is that alpha 2 was trained on TPUs, right, which are not generally speaking, you know, particularly accessible. So um, actually just porting this, porting this to GPUs was already kind of considerable uh, effort uh, with using B for 16s in PyTorch, which is, you know, that combination is quite difficult. Uh, but, but we have that working now on A100 GPUs, which is which is the NVIDIA GPU class that supports BF16s. Uh, we are trying to get FP16 working, which is a sort of a lower precision, 
uh, this would enable um, V100, so uh, GPUs are available on R2. So you could, in principle, one day uh, actually train, I, I don't know if RC would want me to say this, but you can you know, try to train a new version of, of, of AlphaFold, uh, OpenFold on, on uh, R2. Uh, and distributed training is, is achieved versus, uh, versus VR, DeepSpeed, and PyTorch Lightning, which are kind of you know, very sort of widely used uh, distributed, distributed training frameworks. And to, you know, you know, as I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, to, to get this memory efficiency, uh, we had to sort of build our own you know, C++ CUDA kernels for the attention mechanisms in particular to really be able to kind of push this to, to very far in terms of, in terms of uh, memory efficiency. Um, and, and, oh, I should also say, you know, we, we've also done this sort of effort of, of, of pre-computing tons and tons of MSAs, more than DeepMind did for AF2 for the self-distillation step. And that, that's going to be part of the, uh, part of the release. So everybody can, can use these MSAs. Um, so, so let me just, you know, what, what have you learned? So, you know, I mentioned part of this was, was we, we also wanted to learn a bit about how, how we go about training. Um, so so one, one sort of interesting thing, which I think is maybe the most exciting bit that we've learned so far, is that the model seems to achieve very fast convergence. Um, so overall, it's, it's taken us about 80 days of training on 44 A100 GPUs. Um, and and so, so that's a long time, and that's a lot of compute. Uh, however, we essentially achieved 90% of the final IDDT, that's, that's kind of the LDDT score, in two to three days, right? And, and so you see that we, we basically, you know, the, the final, you know, the, the pseudo final IDDT is around 0.9, and, and we got to about 0.8 in two to three days, yeah. So, so this is really exciting, right? Because this suggests that if one wants to, you know, train new variants of alpha, of, of, yeah, alpha fold, open fold, whatever, um, then, then uh, one can do so uh, with, with much more rapid iteration that then then would have then we would have thought to believe you know just based on the original deep mind results right so so th this is exciting i mean to do three days of 44 a 100 views is not, is not little still but it's much more it's much more uh it's, it's much more achievable um another interesting tidbit is that uh, maybe again this kind of goes into a bit into the, the details but the um uh, there's a kind of four stages to the way that off folds trained uh, there's in, in particular last last stages the fine tuning fine tuning stage where essentially the kind of the sizes of the protein cross that gets traded on are increased. Uh, and and I, should, I will say this, this is the trickiest part to get working because it's extremely memory intensive. Uh, also because the MSAs get much deeper, 5,000 5, sequences instead of the original. Uh, so, um, so that's interesting. And we thought maybe this is very critical, but what, what, what this stage seems to largely do is actually resolve physical violations. Uh, the overall accuracy doesn't really get affected. In fact, what happens is that when you do this fine tuning stage, accuracy drops initially, uh, overall accuracy. And then, and then so it starts coming back up um, as the, the physical violations get, get resolved. So these are like stereo clashes, things like that, things that don't make sense uh, physically. And so, um, and so this was kind of an interesting thing that, that wasn't obvious from the, from the initial paper. Um, and, and of course, I mean, you know, what, we are planning extensive ablations far beyond what, what DeepMind has done, um, including kind of analysis of the intermediate models at, you know, as the model gets trained to better understand this behavior um, uh, during, during the process. Um, a couple of other things in terms of what, what we learned as far as training, um, you know, like I said, there are these extremely expensive memory operations like, like this one. Uh, this is the, so the MSA essentially kind of uh, attention procedure, which, which really blows up during the fine tuning stage. Uh, and so, uh, so this is kind of motivated these, uh, uh, these, these kind of memory efficient implementations. Um, other expensive compute ops, maybe I'll kind of, I think this goes a little bit into the details, but basically we have to do a lot of clever things in terms of, you know, like manually, manually sort of managing the memory allocation in, in, in PyTorch to be able to do this. And in, in, in part, I, I, will, I will say this reflects in some ways um, Alpha Full 2's kind of full embrace of functional programming in the JAX language, which or JAX frameworks, which which which, which simplifies some of these things that PyTorch doesn't have. So some of, some of these things are, are are almost a reflection of the limitations of PyTorch that 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 we had to that we had to work around. Um, I have a bunch of details about about sort of the what we've learned that I think I'll skip through. Although I'm happy to answer if people if people want uh, me to to go, delve into it later on, but I'll skip through these just for the sake of time because I know I'm running out of time. Um, so let me just kind of wrap up with this last slide. So, okay, so we're, we're almost done with, with the with a fresh new training, uh, but the next stage that we sort of you know we're going to to hopefully announce in the next uh, next month or so uh, is kind of spinning up a new org that's really going to be kind of an open platform for machine learning biomolecular modeling that's going to be open to the entire community and people can participate in various ways, uh, including companies and, and academic groups and so on, uh, and to go after various problems that that are that are of interest to us and uh, 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 to the community as a whole. Um, you know, multiple conformations, protein small molecules, protein design things of that sort. 
Um, of course, many groups are working on this, uh, uh, including DeepMind. Uh, but the idea here is to have something which is a bit more community grounded and a bit more, let's say, responsive to the priorities of the community. So, so, so there that, will be a mechanism in which various tasks uh, get essentially prioritized based on community input. And these become kind of the things that we work on, uh, particularly in terms of you know, allocating compute resources to go after new versions of, of offfold slash openfold. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I think again, um, uh, much of the, you know, all the real work uh, was done by, by Gustav, uh, along with Nazim, uh, Sasha, and Luna, and a few other folks in my group who have led the, the, the kind of work on the software side. Um, on the on the kind of the organizing side, uh, there's the kind of the executive committee, uh, which is which is comprised from uh, several folks from ind from industry, uh, Sires, Outface, Isaiah, and Genentech, and as well as uh, kind of the let's say you know uh, internal staff at Columbia and and uh, some of the umbrella organizations that are going to sort of um uh house this this new project um so i think um yeah i'm just about on time so thank you very much for your attention um happy to take questions now or later yeah, depending on time thank you so much mohammed i think we'll uh we'll hold off to the questions until the end of the meeting which is in 10 15 minutes from now um or that will be like the question part but um just a quick quick question uh because i think it's maybe it's in people's minds um like when would i be able to use openfold to run something that i'm interested in uh, is there like a timeline for that i know this is research in progress i know things take a while but like is like maybe by like october or something or by the yeah. end of the year or what do you think you'll have uh, up and running so for offfold two ways so if you just want to use a deep mind ways and stick them into openfold you can do that right now you can actually download this on github and and, and that's that's available uh for our new ways probably next week <laughs> Okay, got it. Oh, that's uh, much quicker than I thought. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Mohammed. And we'll wait for uh, another 15 minutes for to take questions. But our last presentation, I want to introduce our last speaker now. Um, so we've got uh, Dr. Jason Key. Dr. Jason Key is a structural biologist by background. He trained in X-ray crystallography, NMR, and drug discovery. Uh, Jason came to HMS in 2012 and since 2014 has overseen the tech side of the SV Grid Consortium. The SB Grid Consortium is a research computing group based at HMS supporting uh, around 445 labs at 150 institutions in over 20 countries. Jason is currently a lecturer in BCMP and Associate Director of Technology for SB Grid and Biogrids. And Jason will be talking about SB Grid and Biogrids, evaluating predictions from AlphaFold. So I've got my structures. Where do we go from here? Take it away, Jason. Great. Can you see my slides? How do I sound? Yep, we can see your slides. We can hear you. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to get to uh, be part of this session. Um, I'm going to uh, jump right in for the, um, uh, the software side. So it, SB Grid is a uh, research computing group based at HMS. We support structural biology groups, mostly through this uh, software collection that we curate and maintain. So we also curate and maintain a slide a stack of software called BioGrids. It's more focused around bioinformatics usage. Each one of these is about 500-ish titles. We keep them up to date and um, make them available to labs all over the world, um, uh, including on O2 and uh, local clusters. So um, you can run SPGrid and BioGrids uh, on HPC resources at Harvard. So it's on O2. It's on the E2 cluster at Boston Children's. Uh, it was on Canon at Harvard at some time. I don't know if it's still in use over there, but it, it's it's available all over. And the software acts is the same no matter where you run it. It's also available on local lab machines, so you can install the software if you have the ability to run AlphaFold. We do Cryo EM. We have lots of GPUs with fast storage, so we can do AlphaFold locally. So we have lots of um, uh, machines where we have AlphaFold installed locally on our GPUs. You can also run it in the cloud if you like. Lots of people like to use the SP Grid tools in AWS or uh, for cloud resources. So for today, I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we have in there that you might use uh, to evaluate AlphaFold predictions. So you've run AlphaFold. Now, where do you go? What do you do? So um, I'm going to talk a bit about aligning and visualizing the models, uh, some of the tools we have to do that, plotting the AlphaFold results, and then some of the tools that we have are just good for further analysis once you have models in hand. Um, so we get like three types of output from your standard AlphaFold run. You get your models, is, the default is five. Uh, you get your PLDDT scores. These are usually in your B factor column. Um, so these, you know, we've heard about these already. These just give you a local distance metric that tells you uh, the quality of local model prediction in your AlphaFold models. And you get your uh, PAE scores. Uh, your predicted align error scores. These are um, 
interdomain accuracy. So within your domains, so it gives you an idea of AlphaFold's confidence around the rough relationships between domains in a multi-domain uh, model. So when you get these from AlphaFold, you get your PDB files. Those are easy enough to look at. The PLDDD scores are embedded in those files, typically in the B factor column. This is a common strategy and uh, people have used this for years to be able to use some arbitrary atom specific data and uh, sort of glob it into a PDB file. Um, it's convenient because you can color by these. And uh, so I'll show how to do that. The PAE scores are typically in a pickle file, which uh, a .pkl file, which is uh, a Python binary file. So these are not easy to view unless you use some additional steps. So uh, we'll talk about how to do that. So one quick way, I think a lot of people like Pymol as their visualization tool. I think the first step that we do when we're looking at AlphaFold uh, models is we align all the models. You know, Pymol is an easy way to do that. Pymol is in SPGrid and BioGrids. There's an open source version of Pymol that is free. So you can uh, easily, uh, you can see here, I just, I ran uh, AlphaFold. I've got five models here. They look like spaghetti, just mished all, mishmashed all over each other. But uh, once you align them, you can see they align pretty well. So in Pymol, you can do this just with a simple menu align objects. Uh, the question you're really trying to answer here is like, do, how do my models agree? Like what's the structural heterogeneity across these five models, right? So I'm just showing two cases here where you have uh, you know, good agreement. All of my models look pretty good. Uh, the structural alignment is good. And then I have this second case where I extended this by you know, some uh, you know, uh, additional number of residues. And we have, you know, it's partial agreement, this common section, but then we have a section where, you know, the alignment isn't so great. So that is sort of our first point that like, okay, that might be a place where uh, our models aren't uh, maybe as high quality as the, the sort of in, end terminal part of the protein. So if you want to get further down into the statistics, uh, there's a script that you can run. It's included in uh, the software stack called Alpha Pickle. So Alpha Pickle is great because you can just give it the directory where you ran your Alpha Pull job, and it will output plots of your PLDDT uh, and your PAE plots. So, and it'll make um, CSV files. So you can take that and put it into your plotting program of choice. But it also outputs uh, PNG images of those plots, just ready to go. So. This is great because it's a command line tool. It's easy to just run on O2 or wherever you're uh, doing your analysis, and then you can copy these back. Um, there's also a version in Colab. Now, this Colab version available, it's not for Colab. It's a version that you wouldn't have to install. So you can go to Colab and run Alpha Pickle because Colab is essentially just a way to run Python programs in the cloud. So this is a Python application. My favorite way to look at these things is using a program called Chimera X. Chimera X is written by Tom Goddard, who is at UCSF. It is a free for academic program uh, that you can freely download. It's also included in the SP grid distribution. It will read your pickle JSON PLDDT data right out of your AlphaFold output. So you could just point it at your AlphaFold directory, load your um, model and plot it by and it will show you these nice heat maps of the PLDDT scores. It's got this great uh, PAE matrix that uh, you can load by default. And some cool things about this that they've added is you can click in that PAE matrix and highlight the residues that it corresponds to in your model. So you can see where those things um, uh, sort of correspond to in your three-dimensional structure. And uh, uh, software developer Tristan Kroll recently made an addition to this to um, do domain prediction based on those PAE plots. So there's a button that says color my PAE domains and it will, uh, based on you know what we sort of see here as these squares of darker colors with light lines in between them, it will isolate those and plot those by color so that you can kind of get a visual sense of where your PAE domains lie. So this is by far the easiest way to like jump in and, uh, and look at your, uh, your results uh, from AlphaFold. So uh, just because I've only got 10 minutes, so just want to give a couple quick slides. All models are wrong, but some are useful. What do we do with these structures now that we've got them? So uh, we want to ask some questions, right? Like, what do we know about similar structures to what I just got from AlphaFold? Can we identify functional elements? Can we identify interfaces where protein dimers might form? So uh, just going to 
recommend some tools. There's a great tool called FoldSeq that lets you just run your model, your search across databases of known structures, including the AlphaFold database. This is great because you can just, uh, it's, it's very fast. Uh, I know there are groups at HMS that are using this. There's also a curated PL, uh, PLDB database that's part of the Schrodinger suite that we have access to at HMS. So you can do these very sophisticated geometric searches. Like you could search just for an active site and say, give me everything in the PDB that has this subset of my model. Um, you can identify cavities, clefts, or ligand binding sites using uh, Schrodinger site map application, which is available. There's a great graphical application called Caver that will show you tunnels and channels through your proteins. Uh, there's a web-based tool. I don't even know this acronym, GAGCOM. It's, uh, it's, it's a great site finder. There's a web-based version. There's a command line version. Uh, it's a great for looking for ligand binding sites in your new models. Um, if you want to look for protein-protein interfaces, I think the first great place to go would be to the AlphaFold Multimer. A lot of people are using this. Just a couple of caveats is that the AlphaFold Multimer will give you pretty convincing multimers for anything you give it, in my hands at least. Like I can, you know, I've made a lot of very convincing coiled coils that look like they would be real. So uh, it's really great. Um, Haddock is uh, worth highlighting because it can incorporate experimental data. So if you have experimental constraints or restraints, you know you've got mutagenesis results, you know two residues are near each other, you can do a docking um, uh, run where these are constrained so that you can take that experimental data into account. Light dock is easy to use. It's pretty fast. It's ready to go. And if you want to really dig in deep, you know, we support Rosetta. It's in there. You can do all sorts of uh, molecular modeling in uh, the Rosetta suite. So if you've got questions, you want to talk structures, you can always reach out to us, help at biogrids.org. You can see all the software that we have available, sbgrid.org and biogrids.org. Those are all updated by the minute. When we push new titles, the websites update automatically. If you've got software you'd like to see, drop us a line. Uh, we're constantly updating. Uh, BioGrids is available to all Harvard uh, researchers and all Harvard affiliates. So if you'd like to give it a try, uh, drop us an email. It's available for Mac and Linux. Um, that's the team. Uh, only two minutes over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. And um, just to reiterate what you uh, what you just said. So this, all these tools and everything on is is on BioGrids, right? Everything that you uh, just talked about. Yeah, there's a, uh, some of them are only in SP Grid. So, but SP Grid and BioGrids are both on O2. Local. Okay. Um, I got you. All of yeah. Alpha Pickle, Alpha Fold, all in BioGrids. Um, uh, and if, so uh, is, if there's, a, yeah, go ahead. So, if I can, if I have an O2 account, I can use these tools. Uh, Chimera X is a graphical tool. So, you'd want to run okay. that on your own, right? Like, you gotcha. You'd want to bring your data back. It's really slow over X11 forwarding, so I, okay. I probably okay. wouldn't do that. But um, uh, PyMol is in uh, is in BioGrids, so sounds good. Again, again, very slow over X11, but you could run it locally. Uh, gotcha. so. I just wanted to highlight the uh, the accessibility of all of these things because uh, I was yeah. also recently introduced to uh, to BioGrids and SP Grids and and uh, the ease of which you can use anything installed there um, as long as you have an account, which everyone here does. So, um, okay, before I open it up to questions again, um, we're reaching the end and I just wanna make a couple of comments. Um, first, I realized I never introduced myself. Uh, my name is Roger Vargas and I am a data scientist at the uh, Center for Computational Biomedicine. Uh, last summer, I defended my PhD, um, which I also got from Harvard Medical School and Dr. Maha Farhat's lab. So I've been around the, the Harvard Medical School ecosystem for a little while. Um, next, I want to mention that um, a lot of the slides that we presented today, the slides that um, me and RC presented, and, um, and the recording to this talk is all going to be uploaded to the CCB website later this week or early next week, and we'll send everyone an email when that's done with the link accordingly, so you'll all have access to that. And finally, um, this would not have been possible without all of our fantastic speakers and all of the organizational efforts from everyone. So if everyone could just take themselves off of mute and applaud with me uh, thank, to thank all the speakers, that would be, that would be fantastic. Thank you everyone for helping, for having put this together. All right. Yeah, we used to do that at a, I did an internship at a biotech company a couple of summers ago, and that was the thing where we would all take ourselves off of mute and, uh, and applaud. Okay. So uh, now let, we can open it up to questions um, uh, for Jason or Mohammed or, um, or for other questions. And I think uh, just to give con everyone considerate 
uh, is to consider it with everyone's time. We'll have a hard cutoff at 3.40. This is supposed to go to 3.30, but sometimes things run over. If you need to hop off, hop off at 3.30, but we'll have a hard cutoff at 3.40. Okay, um, so um, let's go with Dr. Gailani Khan. I think I saw that name, that hand first. Hi. Uh, my question is, let's say we have a 10,000 base pair of a complex, uh, sorry, a minus of a complex, and 5,000 of them already known as a structure. Can we fit the known structure in the complex to the system and then use the, the rest of 5,000 to dock on the, on the complex and by you know, taking the burden on the CPUs or GPUs basically? That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. It's not, certainly it's not an easy thing to do with um, the way that uh, AlphaFold or ColabFold takes input, um, but maybe um, uh, Sergey or Mohammed can answer this more. I, I mean, you're probably going to have to, it's not going to be alpha fold anymore. <laughs> if, if, if you want to use alpha fold, you're going to have to stick the whole thing in there. Right? It, there's no way for it to kind of take a structure and just like somehow not, not try to, you know, actually do the full processing over that. Um, but I mean, I mean, you know, there were other kind of docking tech schemes that were mentioned. And you could, you could imagine, you know, predicting the 5,000 residues separately and then trying to dock it using conventional methods, but, but it won't, won't be simply alpha fold multum or anything like that. Got it. Thank you. You don't know the rest of 5,000, you know, the, the, the point is that whether AlphaFold can predict the 5,000 unknown sequence and dock onto the known structure. Right, I mean, yeah, so, so my, my point is that you, you would, from, from the memory slash time complexity issue, you, you, you can't get away with not having the 10,000 all there, essentially. You, you could feed it the template for the 5,000 so that it's sort of strongly biased to, to maintain that structure, the one that you do know. But just but but it will still process it in a way as if it's with ten thousand. Um, so 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 that that you, you can't escape that kind of problem. Got it. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, okay, and we see I see Peter um, Myers hand up. Thank you, Evan. Great talks, everybody. So one, I had two questions, but I get the first one regarding the the open fold. Is that similar to the deep learning model compilers that have been talked about for generic generic deep learning models, or is that something that is that something different? No, it's different. I mean, it's 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 mostly about the implementation in a new language, right? The the, the and, and Python. I mean, Jax actually compiles Python doesn't even do that. Um, the the one thing we did do, but again, it's not related to, to compilation, is that we built custom CUDA kernels, right? So we didn't just rely on kind of PyTorch primitives, but we actually went and wrote kind of essentially GPU code that, that runs directly on the GPU for these very sort of uh, memory intensive, you know, operations that, that, are, that are really uh, critical to make things move smoothly. Um, but but yeah, that's a, that's a separate problem from kind of like automated yeah, well, I, compilation. I, I, yeah. Maybe there's like two uses of compilation, but I, there, there's the, you know, compiling the, the kernels for the GPU, but there's also been some, okay. some work on like, you have a deep learning model how do you make a functionally equivalent deep learning model that is less memory intensive and faster inference times? And right, I've right. seen some some CS papers on those, and it sounded a lot like what you were talking about, at least with my limited understanding of deep learning. That's not what we're doing, no. But 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 it's certainly something that I mean I think would, would be exciting to pursue. Uh, and there's also the kind of the distillation idea where you essentially train a smaller model on data data from the larger model and essentially try to sort of, you know, maintain performance or take a sl slight performance penalty, but, but you know, at much reduced computational costs. Those are all things that we would, we would love to pursue, but, 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 but that's not what it currently is. Okay, thank you. And side note, not a question, but thank you for doing OpenFold because one of my pet peeves about AlphaFold 2 has been like, what about the training component? So. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'll just add that uh, we started adding it uh yesterday to the software stack so it is in progress at the moment but uh so so yeah i'm excited to try it out <laughs> okay uh next question mr uh, jeremy amon oh hi um so with my very basic understanding of all this and this may have been sort of getting out with some of the earlier questions um my understanding is that AlphaFold and CollabFold only really process on one GPU. Uh, are there any efforts to 
parallelize where we can split up the job across multiple GPUs to increase speed? Um, so with OpenFold, you know, principally because we are using the, uh, DeepSpeed and PyTorch, in principle, you do get free model, model, model parallelism, uh, although we haven't really pushed it. So, so I, I can't say that it works or, or, or works well. Um, it, it's, we, we've mostly tried to focus on making the single GPU sort of inference faster, but, but that, is not a, that, that, is, that is a sensible direction as well to take it in, to try to actually fuse multiple GPUs. You know, at least it's not hard to get eight, certainly on a single node nowadays. Um, so, so I would say kind of work in progress and, and maybe it works out of the box, but, but I would be skeptical. Okay, and we'll have one final question to uh, Kinchin Liu. Hello, I have another question for Sergey. Um, so if I'm going to do the uh, heterodimer prediction, uh, in addition to the P P P P P P PMT score I can look at to check the confidence. Is there any other ways I can further evaluate the confidence of the heterodimer I predicted? Um, yeah, so the, the PTM score is supposed to be a summary statistic of that whole thing. But what you could do is you, if you get that JSON file or the pickle file, the PA value, you could, you could sort of pick out just the residues at the interface that you care about and like try to evaluate uh, because the other thing is like, if you get that number, maybe like half the interface is well predicted, but the other half is not confident. Uh, and so the PTM value will look low, but in fact, you still confident about half that interface. So, so I think looking at the individual values, um, okay. maybe there's some way to plot that. I'm not sure. Maybe like as, as, as lines between the protein and coloring those or something, that could be a way to, okay, I see. a way to plot I see. that. Um, That's super helpful. Thank you. Huh? All right, so we've reached time. Uh, so I just want to thank all the speakers again for making this a really informative uh, meeting. And um, if yeah, if no one has any further questions, I think we'll call it a day. I hope that everyone has found this useful. Um, please feel free to reach out to RC or CCB people like me um, if you have any further questions. And uh, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks for hosting, Roger. Of course, thanks for joining, Jason. Thank you, Sergey. You're welcome. Thanks.